Friday here, then uh, the, just a few things out of the board. The sign of Friday is uh, due a little bit later on Monday. Uh, all the questions are now posted for that uh, assignment. And there's only one correction is that the question 3.3.3 is sold and flow when you're looking at the counter current system. Um, that should be 27.5 kilograms per hour rather than 15 that you posted in the earlier version. So if you download the PDF earlier on, uh, please just update that to 27.5. Also, uh, the fourth assignment is available at the front to pick up afterwards uh, for end midterm. And if you're in the 4M class, I will go to 4M midterms here if you want to pick those up. And finally, uh, just the course evaluations are running this week. 39% uh, of the people have already responded. Uh, so if you can, uh, if you haven't done that yet, please fill it in. Okay, so last class we started uh, talking a bit about some of the terminology related to psychometric trials. And I will continue on from where we left off and uh, wrap up today with, uh, with, the, with all this terminology we'll come into the example that we'll look at at the end. So it's a comprehensive example that brings everything together. So we were looking at the psychometric chart and uh, one of the temperatures we're interested in is this anodic saturation temperature, which says essentially if we have an inlet gas stream coming in at a certain temperature T and we're contacting it with water um, and we're hoping that it will reach equilibrium, that that gas will then leave at a, at a different temperature Ts and with a different humidity psi s. So this gas T coming in fairly warm is going to pick up vapor from this adiabatic system. And the energy to vaporize that liquid water to the vapor phase comes from the system itself. In other words, it comes from this inlet gas T. So the energy in T is used to vaporize water, and so the Ts, the temperature of that gas leaving then is lower. The humidity of the gas leaving is obviously higher since it's picked up that water that's been vaporized. And in the last class, we, were, uh, we started doing an enthalpy balance around the system. Uh, simply, we said, let's take the enthalpy coming in. So from this inlet gas, the enthalpy coming in is the temperature of, of, the, of the gas multiplied by its heat capacity, Cs. So we, we defined the heat capacity for a vapor-air uh, mixture last time. So Cs is, is exactly like the heat capacity, except it takes into account the fact that there's water and air in that stream. And then our reference temperature we chose was Ts. So T minus T ref or T minus Ts um, in this case. And we chose our reference temperature to be Ts for that reason that essentially allows us then to disregard water in the system since water is at Ts in, in throughout that cycle. So, so that's for convenience that it was chosen. There's an additional term, the enthalpy, uh, due to, to get the material into the vapor phase. And the amount of material that we have in the vapor phase is given by psi kilograms of water per kilograms of dry air. Then the enthalpy leaving is, since that stream is leaving is at Ts, that, that first term is essentially zero, and then psi s now here tells us how much additional water vapor we're, we're taking out of the system uh, multiplied by its uh, heat, by that heat of vaporization over there. So if we equate those two, in is equal to out, and rearrange the equation, we can get this in a fairly convenient form, psi minus psi s divided by t minus t s. And the reason why I chose those, uh, those chose it like that is because it, it corresponds to the x and the y axis in the psychometric charts. So let's, let's go back here then, on my y axis in the psychometric charts, I have the humidity psi, and on my x axis, I have the dry bulb temperature t. So a change in psi over a change in t is essentially telling me what the slope is in that plot. So a change in psi over a change in t is then equal to this heat capacity divided by the heat of vaporization. Substituting in the values from before, the heat capacity then given by that formula in the numerator. And it's, it's, it's interesting actually, it's saying essentially that the slopes on this plot are a function of psi. Okay, so it's actually, your slope isn't constant throughout the plot. Those lines look like they're parallel, they look like they're constant, but there is actually a very slight curvature to them. The slopes are not really constant. The slopes are, in fact, a function of where you are on the y-axis side. 
But that, that term there, slope smaller, essentially it appears that the slopes on the curve are essentially parallel to each other for, for the most part. Um, if we want to know the wider range, you start to see some <coughs> So what it says is if we look at where we were on the system, our inlet coming in at temperature T and humidity psi, we were leaving at psi S and TS, that stream leaving is in equilibrium. We've saturated that air as much as we can. We cannot take up any more water vapor into that stream at that temperature Ts. So what we've done is we've moved from this point over here, T and Psi on the X and Y axis, up to 100% saturation, Ts and Psi S, along those, those lines. So this is the adiabatic line over there. And that temperature Ts is the adiabatic saturation temperature. So our incoming air stream was at about 87. <coughs> In this example, I just arbitrarily chose it, but if it were to have come in at 8 degrees, 82 degrees, we would have had recorded leaving there that humidified streams at 100% humidity, and now we get 40 degrees. So our incoming stream was very hot air. Leaving, we've cooled it down to 40 degrees C, and we've increased the humidity of that stream. So there was this little exercise in the class last time um, in the notes, and it's also very similar to the one in assignment five, saying if we have an airstream at 70 degrees Celsius carrying uh, 0 0.055 kilograms of water per kilogram dry air, we're contacting that in an adiabatic system until it reaches equilibrium. What's the percentage humidity of the incoming airstream? So uh, everyone has a psychometric chart. Anyone need one? This is our duplicates here, so if you want one extra from last time. So you should be able to prove to yourself that at 70 degrees C and 055 that you get a humidity of 20%. Mm -hmm. to provide 
why to keep going in steady state operation? Well, if we're putting in water coming in here at 55 grams per minute, and we're leaving at 66 grams per minute, we need to then provide a make of water of 11 grams per minute to keep the system going in steady state. It's a very straightforward small exercise there just to test your understanding of the data value saturation temperature. The next and final temperature we need to understand um, is the wet bulb temperature. Now the wet bulb temperature is recorded as follows. As we take a thermometer over here, just this top one, if I zoom in a bit, it may not be so clear. There's a small piece of cotton over that temperature, over that thermometer, this uh, tip over there, that's kept moist with water. And there's a, a reference thermometer next to it. So this one's recording the dry bulb temperature, this one's recording the wet bulb temperature. And we take this thermometer and in the airstream, uh, we hold it there by the handle and just swing it around very fast. So you're creating a very high velocity airstream around that thermometer. The water that's in that cotton tip over there will start to evaporate until it reaches an equilibrium temperature. Now the temperature of the ambient environment that I'm swinging this in, I'm not going to change the temperature or the humidity of that air around me by any amount, by, by, by evaporating a small amount of water off there. So essentially I'm in an infinite medium of constant temperature and constant humidity and I'm swinging that around. The heat to evaporate that water in that cotton is coming from the thermometer to itself and it will be at a lower temperature clearly than this reference temperature on this other thermometer. So I'm going to record two very different temperatures here because I'm continually taking energy out of the system to, uh, to evaporate that water off until I reach some equilibrium. So in doing that, I can set up the same enthalpy equations that we looked at previously for the previous system. And very coincidentally, that slope coefficient we calculate for the enthalpy temperature, uh, sorry, for the uh, humidity temperature on the x and y axis for this system is identical or extremely close to the adiabatic uh, temperature that we calculated in the previous slides. Um, and that only holds for water. So this coincidence works really well, only for water, but essentially it tells us then that the adiabatic saturation temperature is for water air system the same as the wet bulb temperature. So this slope, if we if we read at, at started at some initial point with a certain temperature and the humidity, this point over here has a, has a certain dry bulb temperature, its wet bulb temperature fall, follows along exactly that same slope as, as, as the slopes that are currently shown. These slopes that are currently shown are adiabatic saturation curves, but for water air, those are exactly the same slopes you follow to get the wet bulb temperature. So let's just quickly recap what wet bulb temperature is. It's the temperature experienced by that thermometer when it's got a very high velocity of constant temperature and constant humidity air passing over it. This is going to become important when we actually start to look at dryers in a minute. The dry end is nothing more than exactly that. We're taking solids and we're exposing it to a constant stream of high velocity air at a constant temperature, at uh, an elevated temperature, and, 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 and a certain amount of humidity is coming in our incoming air. That's constant and we're passing it over solids to dry it off. We're going to be interested in what is the temperature right at that solid interface where that evaporation is taking place. That's going to be that wet bulb temperature. Right at the interface there of that cotton where the, the evaporation is occurring, that's a lower temperature, the ambient temperature out here is something higher, that temperature difference is what's driving the evaporation. So we're, the wet bulb temperature is very important to understanding and sizing the dryer for, and to determine its capacity. Okay, so it just seems to be a non-ending list of definitions. There's one final one before we can get uh, going with this material, and that's the human volume. The human volume is, you can visualize it or understand it conceptually as the inverse of the density of moist air. Um, so if we, if we would, uh, it's clear to us that if we start to load our air, our dry air with moisture, we're adding water to this air, the density of that of the unit volume of that mixture is going to change as we add more and more water to it. So 
we need some way to quantify the density of this air-water mixture as a function of the amount of water that's in that, in that mixture. Okay, so pure air on its own, we, we easy, easily can find its density. It's roughly one kilogram per meter cube. But the moment we start to add moisture to that, that dry air, we're going to increase the density. So uh, we can derive from the ideal gas law exactly by following that principle what that density is. So I've just shown you the simplified result, but there's an earlier equation that, uh, that the, where this comes from, the simplification comes from, that simply uses the ideal gas law and sums up the density due to the air and sums up the density due to the water and, and adds it. So here's, here we get exactly what we expect, this, this human volume, VH, which is one over the density. So VH is one over the rho of this water air mixture is a function of these two constants, which come from the ideal gas law simplification, but then also psi, the humidity, and the temperature T. So that's, that both of those make intuitive sense to us. As we add more, uh, more material into that, into that mixture, our density is going to change. As our temperature increases, our density is going to change. So this function here just gets us what that density is as a, a um, based on the humidity and the temperature. You notice though that the temperature here is in Kelvin. So a small example then, if we had air at this 0 0.026 kilograms of water per kilogram dry air, so that's my humidity at 350 Kelvin, substitute in there, I get a pH of 1.03 meters cubed per kilogram moist air. Or the inverse of that is the density, it's also roughly at one. So we, we get numbers that are pretty close to the density of air itself. Basically because the amount of moisture we have in here is very small. We've only got uh, 26 grams of water per kilogram of air. So we don't expect that water to affect the density too much. So these numbers almost always for VH are in the order of, of, of around one. Okay, so now let's take a look at what's happening in a dryer. Let's understand a bit of the, the mechanics of what's going on, and then we'll derive an equation for this heat and mass transfer that's occurring. And uh, at the end of the class today, we'll be able to determine some drying times. So how solids dry is very complex and varies among the different solids. But there's a very uh, convenient simplification that takes place. And I'll talk about that now. So a typical profile for solids drying you'll see this for a wide variety of solids is as follows. I've got two complementary views of it, so let's take a look at this. The first one here on the left is I'm looking at the time domain um, profile of what's occurring. So on my x-axis I have time, my y-axis I have the amount of water that's retained in the solids per mass of dry material. So this is my mass fraction of water. Kilograms of water per kilogram dry solid. And we learned in last class that every solid has some form of equilibrium temperature, equilibrium uh, moisture content that it will go towards. If left in a, in a certain environment, we showed in the previous class what those equilibrium uh, moisture contents look like. So given enough time, the system will naturally go to that equilibrium. And here let's take a look at what it is. If we start at some certain moisture content, capital A, we have this this ramp here, where if we take the solid and we expose it to a temperature, so we're take, taking my, my moist solids and I'm putting it in a drying oven, for example, there's a period of time where there's a bit of a warm up of the solids and I'm slowly starting to get some of my moisture falling off. So the amount of moisture per mass of dry solid starts to, starts to fall off as I just start to evaporate. This distance A to B for many solids is actually so small that you don't actually even notice that you can, um, essentially this part from A to C pretty much looks like a straight line for most, uh, for most materials, but for some you'll see a small um, kind of little curvature over here. But the critical, uh, sorry, the part of interest for us actually is this region from B to C, which can be fairly extensive, that the length from B to C can be very long in the time and this is essentially a period where there's constant reduction in moisture over time. 
So the rate at which I'm removing moisture is constant. So that's a straight line at a, at, at a constant slope. So that's why I say for many systems you won't even see this part going from A to B because that whole section A to C just looks like you're seeing continual drop off in moisture over time. What's happening there essentially is that there's so much moisture in, in this material we're drying that it's readily available to us. So if I looked at a cross-sectional profile of my solid, what it looks like is here in gray is my moisture and in white is the solid particles. There's enough water available at the surface of the solid that there's plenty of contact with the drop with the airstream that it's contacting. So there's no limitation. There's no rate limiting amount of water. In other words, I'm able to provide moisture rapidly to the surface of the solid so that really the only limitation to getting that water evaporated is the, is the boundary layer on the solid surface. As I drive this moisture off, I now have to start to bring moisture from the interior of the solid up to the surface. So now we're in the region from C to D. My drying rate starts to slow down because I now start to get limited to by how fast I can bring the moisture from the interior of the solid to the surface. So if you think of like a wood plank or a wood board that you're trying to dry, you have to bring the moisture from the interior of the wood up to the surface of the wood, and then that has to get evaporated off. So in region B to C, in this constant period, I'm able to bring that moisture up to the surface fast enough, but after a while, I'm running out of moisture in my solid, and it takes me a while to get that moisture from the interior up to the surface. And so I start to see the rate at which I'm drying falling off, slowing down. So that's called my first falling rate drying period. And then D to C is an even slower um, rate of drying as well, now the way you're really constrained to bring to bringing that moisture up. So the happy coincidence is that for drying almost for many solids, that we're operating in region B to C for, for, many, for many solids because we're able to get that moisture to the surface from the heat transfer perspective. The type of solid we're drying does not matter because we're, we're essentially just seeing liquid water at the surface and dry air. And we're simply just moving the liquid into that air stream. It doesn't really matter what the solid is, this white part is, for almost all systems that what we're really just concerned with is getting the liquid, the gray, into the bulk air stream around it. And that we can do at constant rate. So the, the nice thing about that coincidence is that deriving the heat transfer equations is independent of the solid type because we're really just essentially considering the liquid system there in gray versus the air, the bulk air around it. So let's just uh, talk a bit about the, the math here. We're going to define capital X then as the mass of water remaining in the solids per dry mass solid. And I'm interested in the rate at which I'm drying, or in other words, the water flux. How much water am I removing per unit area per unit time? So dx by dt is that flux of water that I'm removing. So if I look then at this plot here on the left is the time, the time domain plot. If I look at it from a rate perspective, in other words, I just take the derivative of this curve. And instead of plotting the derivative with respect to time, I plot the derivative with respect to x, the amount of moisture still remaining in the solid. I get essentially what I'm interested in is this constant flat period B to C where I'm operating at essentially the same rate of moisture being removed per unit time. So this, this plot over here is, a, is, my, is my water flux axis. And essentially, I'm, what I'm saying is that for, for the vast majority of drying systems, we're operating at constant flux, constant removal of water per unit time per unit surface area. Okay, so that's dx by dt. And because x is defined as mass of water per mass of dry solid, um, it's, we multiply by ms, then the mass of the dry solid to get that solid out. That's constant, obviously, so we can take it out of the derivative and bring it up to the front. 
So dx by dt is the rate of water removed per unit time, or I can also uh, write it in terms of mw, mass of water evaporated out of the solid. And so the negative drops out there because x is mass of water remaining, mw is mass of water evaporated, so, uh, so from a mass balance that, that negative just takes, takes those away. And we will tend to use the last form over there, d, d mass of water evaporated per unit time divided by the surface area. Okay, so that's a bit of terminology. And we're going to look at modeling in the constant rate drying period. Um, there are equations to look at modeling the system during this falling off period, but as you can imagine, this falling off period is very much a function of the type of solid we're dealing with. Whereas in the constant rate period, as I've mentioned, it's really independent of the solid type we're dealing with because we're only considering heat transfer from the air stream into this liquid at the surface and mass transfer at the surface to the, to the vapor. So the type of solid really doesn't play a role in the constant drying period. That's why it's, it's, it's easier to look at that from a modeling perspective, but it's also more practical because for the vast majority of solids, that is the region that we operate in. Okay, so during that constant rate period, the rate limiting step is the mass transfer itself through the boundary layer. And we're essentially saying the solids is able to provide water to that surface fast enough. So as long as that holds, then our modeling in the constant rate period is, is valid. So let's take a look at what that model is. This, this slide looks more complex than it really is. So in the constant rate drying period, that wet surface is continually um, we're, we're continually providing moisture to that wet surface from the interior of the solid. And what we're saying is that all the heat that's given to the system goes into evaporating the liquid. So the heat transfer coming in is only taken up to evaporate the, the liquid. So then that allows us to say the following. The water flux, kilograms of water per hour per unit area, is equal to the heat flux. Heat flux is joules per hour per area. How can I equate joules on the left on the left hand side, on the right hand side with kilograms on the on the left hand side? Well I can multiply this water flux kilograms with the heat of vaporization, which is kilojoules per kilograms. So water flux is kilograms per hour meter squared. Heat flux is joules per hour meter squared. So the only difference between the units on the left and the right is then joules and kilograms. So delta H map then takes care of that by saying that's the amount of energy required to vaporize a certain or one kilogram of, of water. So essentially I am equating heat with heat here after taking the delta H map into account. Okay, so that clear? So it's the left hand side is simply saying how much energy do I need to evaporate this water out? The right hand side is saying how much energy is coming in. So energy out, or energy to evaporate is on the left, energy coming in supplied by the air is on the right. So let's substitute in there. The water flux we derived earlier as dmw by dt, the mass of water evaporated per unit time, per unit area. Now heat flux, let's take a look at heat flux. Heat flux we know is or any flux, as we've seen in this course and in other courses before, is the, the driving force divided by the resistance. Our driving force here is the temperature difference. The temperature difference between the air and the temperature difference at the solid surface. That's my driving force, is the air temperature, my dry bulb temperature of this incoming air that I'm passing over those solids, minus the temperature right at that solid surface where that evaporation is happening. That liquid vapor interface is where, where the evaporation is occurring. So that's my driving force. Resistance then is the heat, one over the heat transfer coefficient. So one divided by H, my heat transfer coefficient. We're going to take a look at what that heat transfer coefficient is in a minute. But as you would expect, the resistance is going to be dependent on the boundary layer thickness. And that boundary layer thickness is going to be a function of how fast I am moving that airstream over the solid. So the velocity of the airstream is going to be a strong function um, in that resistance expression. So we'll look at H in a minute. 
So let's rearrange this equation then a bit. Uh, d and w by dt bring the area over to the right hand side, bring the heat of vaporization over to the right hand side. Let's simplify this. The temperature of the air is the dry bulb temperature. And the temperature at the solid surface is the wet bulb temperature. So that's why I said earlier in the wet bulb derivation, it's the temperature that a thermometer experiences when you're moving an airstream very rapidly over that thermometer. What is the temperature right at that thermometer tip where there's a, a moist environment? So that's the wet bulb temperature. So that's why we needed those two. Let's integrate then a bit uh, the dmw by dt. That's the mass of water changing over time. So if I integrate between some initial mass and the final mass, and some initial time to a final time, that amount of water I removed, let me call it delta mw, so the mass of water that I've evaporated in this time from T0 to Tf is then given by this integral over here. Now, none of these terms in the integral change over time. The heat transfer coefficient we assume to be constant. The area is constant. Um, that may or may not be true for some solids. Some solids might shrink as you dry them, so the area could change over time, but let's assume that we, we don't have that for now. The dry bulb temperature is fixed. That's the temperature of the hot air that I'm using to dry my solid. I'm maintaining that temperature. The wet bulb temperature stays constant as well because that's at that solid liquid interface. I'm, so I'm simply just taking up the energies provided by the, by the hot air stream is going only to evaporate water. And we know that evaporation occurs at constant temperature as we go from the solid phase to the liquid phase. So I don't expect my wet bulb temperature at the interface of the solid of the vapor liquid to be changing. And heat of vaporization also is constant. So all those terms come out of the integral and essentially I'm left then on the right hand side with the time from T0 to Tf, in other words the time to remove delta n kilograms of water is given by this expression over here. Okay, so Let's just then uh, take a look at the heat transfer coefficients. Heat transfer coefficients H um, are derived, there's many, many such heat transfer coefficients, but as I explained earlier, the, because we're in this constant rate drying period, they're independent of the type of solid. Okay? Independent of solid type. So these, co these two uh, uh, correlations here can be used for all solids. Provided they meet some conditions. So here's one for parallel flow to the surface. Provided our area is between 45 and 150 C. And we have this G value, which I'll talk about in a minute, lying between this lower bound and upper bound. And G is given as, as a flux of air, kilograms of air per hour per meter squared. So please note the units there are hours. We're going away from SI units here. Um, this is just common with this area, is that it's kilograms per hour is usually the time unit that's used as hours. This would correspond to a velocity of about 0.6 to 7.6 meters per second. And that G value is defined as 3,600 meters per hour times the density of the air mixture times the velocity, where the velocity and density are taken in SI units. Multiply by 3,600 and you calculate your G. So if you know the velocity of your air, you know the, the uh, density of it, we just looked at that formula for the density of an air vapor mixture a minute ago. So I know those two values multiplied by 3,600. As long as I'm between that lower and upper bound, then I can use this correlation to calculate my heat transfer coefficient h. So g raised to the point h multiplied by this constant, and g is in this unit where there's hours in the denominator. But then I get out of this SI unit, so watts per meter squared Kelvin or joules per second per meter squared Kelvin is my heat transfer coefficient. So now I have everything I need to go use this formula over here. Heat of vaporization, I can look up from steam tables. Dry bulb temperature and wet bulb temperature, I can look up from my psychrometric charts. A is the area of my solids. H is this heat transfer coefficient that I've just shown you. And I can then use that to relate the time to remove a certain amount of water. 
So we're now ready to, to start using this equation to solve practical problems. So H given here for parallel flow, and then a second formula given here for perpendicular flow. And there's other formulas for H when you're using pelletized solids, or if you've got a fluidized bed. Um, there's uh, several formulas for H that you can look up for that. Now, this equation makes, makes a lot of sense. Let's just take a look at it again before we go into the example. It says, the time to remove delta n kilograms of water, how, this is how long it is to remove a certain amount of water. Well, it's clear that if I have a lot of water to remove, delta m, I'm going to take a longer time. So that makes sense. The heat of vaporization, if here we're dealing with water systems, but in, in systems in general, if the heat of vaporization is very small, it means I need a little energy to go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, I would expect the amount of time I require to be small as well. So the fact that that's in the numerator makes absolute sense. Let's take a look at the denominator. The time to remove a certain amount of water, if my dry wall temperature is high, in other words, I use a really hot airstream, so down here, if I move along my x-axis to higher and higher temperatures, higher and higher dry wall temperatures, that makes sense. I can re reduce the amount of time to remove that water as I provide a hotter airstream. And if my wet bulb temperature difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature, as that temperature difference gets larger, the time taken is reduced as well. Let's take a look at, at that. So if um, here's my uh, incoming air at 70 degrees is my, my dry wall temperature. And if I'm, do you have your laser pointer here? Okay, so this one's, okay, here's, okay, so here's my incoming air stream. And let's say we're at a certain humidity, 10% uh, relative humidity. So there's my dry wall temperature. If I go diagonally along here, I get my wet bulb temperature. So that difference then, that delta, is the amount of that, that temperature difference driving force. So the greater that that driving force is, the more of a shorter time it would take to remove that amount of water. Now what's really interesting is, let's take, let's take a constant incoming temperature, 60 degrees C for example. And if I take a 60 degree airstream at 10% humidity, that's my dry bulb temperature 60, the wet bulb temperature is 30. So I've got a 30 degree difference over here. But now if I take, I'm still at 60 degrees, but I'm taking a more humid airstream, let's take it at 40% humidity, the wet bulb temperature there is 45. So 60 minus 45 is 15 degrees. Okay, so I've got a very small, te a smaller temperature difference if I've got a more humid airstream. So that makes absolute sense. My incoming airstream is more humid, I've got less capacity to load up that airstream with, with water. So that delta difference in the denominator becomes smaller, meaning it takes a longer time to remove the material. Practical example of this is if you're in, your, you've been in a car, you've turned it on in the winter, and you, or you've got four or five passengers in the car, and that windscreen fogs up. So you've all driven in a car where that front windscreen fogs up. What do, what do you do? Do you turn up the heat or do you turn on the air conditioner? Which one's going to remove the fog off the windscreen fastest? You've got a certain amount of water to remove the windscreen that's constant. Heat of vaporization is constant. Heat transfer coefficient is constant. Air is constant. Do you turn on the air conditioner or do you turn on the heat? So heat's going to increase dry bulb temperature. You also turn on the air conditioner as well because the air conditioner will remove humidity from the air. So you're now operating at high temperature with low incoming air. Okay, so in my car, I can control the two independently. I've pr proven this to myself. On a cold winter's day, if I turn on just the heat, I'll remove the, the, the fog. But if I turn on the heat and the AC at the same time, 
I'll remove the fog far faster, often like in a couple of seconds. Okay, so same idea. You bring in an airstream high temperature, but with low humidity. So the lower the humidity, and that's all the AC is in your car. Your AC is just a device to remove humidity from the air. So low humidity, high temperature gives you a larger delta temperature, a high dB minus WB. So the bigger that gap, the more air you can take up in that, uh, sorry, the more water you can take up in that air stream. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. Here's a, a company in Qatar has published these photos on Flickr of their big filter press. So we didn't get a chance to look at filter presses in this course, but uh, membranes are really are, are essentially filters. But here, a conventional filter press, we take uh, cloth type panels and we run our slurry through them and the water passes through leaving the solids behind in these vertical panels. That's then decompressed afterwards, it's opened up and the solids are dropped out in what are called filter cakes. So it's a, it's a moist pieces of solid and they're a few centimeters thick and you can see that impression of the filter cloth still left on the solid. So if we consider 100 kilograms of cake, in this case this is sand or, um, or some sort of chemical uh, that's got a sand-like consistency, 100 kilograms of this moist cake at 30% on a wet basis. We've got air available at 75 degrees C at 10% humidity with a velocity of 4 meters per second parallel to the solids in a tray dryer. So let's just take a look at the tray dryer. A tray dryer is we simply put these trays in, in a large room and we run hot air over in a circular, in a circular manner to, to dry that, the solids that are in the tray. So we're, we're simply taking these cake, this cake here and it's sort of got one, uh, sort of two meters squared exposed, that's my area, and I'd like to dry it down to 10% on a dry basis. So I've intentionally chosen wet basis and dry basis in this example to illustrate what uh, the difference is. What's the amount of time it's going to take to dry that? So let's just take a look at that quickly. So here's a piece of cake, let's say it's 100 kilograms. Some fraction of that is water and some fraction of that is dry solid. So we've got 100 kilograms of that, what 30% on a wet basis means by that terminology, you'll see this often, is it simply says that I've got 70 kilograms of dry solids and 30 kilograms of water in there. So that's what we mean by the terminology 30% wet basis. Let me just uh, quickly point out what dry basis is, because um, I may not be able to finish this example in class today, but at least you'll be able to then go home and try it yourself. The dry basis means, if I had said, uh, let's take an example, so 200 kilograms of wet cake, and if I had said 30% dry basis moisture, what that comes down to is um, you say 30 divided by 130. So consider a conceptual uh, 100 kilograms of solids. 30 kilograms of that is water and 130 kilograms is the water plus the solid. Okay, so that ratio times 200 gets you 46.15 kilograms of water. And then the remaining would be the dry cake. In other words, 153.85 kilograms dry salt. So that's the difference between a wet basis and a dry basis. The wet basis is easier to work with. You simply then just take the fraction of that to get the amount of water. But the reality is that most often we deal with dry basis because when we 
take a quantity of solid, we don't know how much is water and how much is dry. Usually what we do is we take a, a quantity of salt or moist material, shove it in an oven and dry it for hours and hours, and then we weigh the dry portion after this. So essentially we calculate the dry basis more often than the wet basis. But I'd like to illustrate both to you so you understand how they work. Um, so if I said 30% dry basis, uh, simply take 30 divided by 130, times the amount of, of wet cake. And you can prove to yourself afterwards, uh, so 46.15 divided by 153.85, that gets you 0.3, okay? So that simply says, take your amount of water divided by your amount of dry solid, and you'll get uh, your, your dry basis back again. Okay, so, so be aware of that terminology of the dry basis and wet basis. So we're taking, in this case, 30% uh, of a, a solid 100 kilograms of cake, which is at 30% moisture on the wet basis, and we like to dry it. So what, we're, what we need to know is how much water we're removing. Well, we're starting with 30 kilograms of water. we'd like to get down to 10% on a dry basis. So 10% on a dry basis says, well, if I'm starting with 30 kilograms of water, minus x, how much water am I going to remove, divided by 70 kilograms of dry material, that's going to equal 0.1. That's from the definition of what a dry basis is. A dry basis says 0.1 is equal to the amount of water remaining in the solid. So I started off with 30 kilograms, I'm going to remove x kilograms, divided by the kilograms of dry solid I started off with. I can solve that then for x is equal to 29.3 kilograms of water to evaporate. So I'm, I know that I'm starting off with 30 kilograms of water in that 100 kilograms of cake. My target is to get to a 10% dry basis afterwards. So that implies I need to remove 29.3 kilos of water. That is essentially equal to my delta M water that I had in the previous equation. So what I'll do is I'll leave it at this point, but I'll ask you to please to go through these five steps. Are the approach to take to get to that final drying time. You need to calculate the humidity of your air, you need to know the wet bulb temperature, you need to calculate the density of that humid volume, you need to calculate the heat transfer coefficients, and then finally you substitute all of those terms into that drying time equation we derived earlier. So take a look through this example. Um, I'll take it up in class tomorrow for the first few minutes and then I'll do the wrap.